I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jennifer Shuba of the Wilson Center, who will set the stage for our discussion from a demographic standpoint. She is one of the best political demographers in the nation. Let me tell you a little bit about her after I clear my throat. <coughs> Jennifer Shuba is an internationally recognized expert in the field of demographic security. In addition to numerous academic articles, she is author of the book, Eight Billion and Counting, How Sex, Death, and Migration Shape Our World in 2022, as a publication date and the future faces of war, population, and national security. And she is the editor of the book, A Research Agenda for Political Demography, which came out in 2021. I'm pleased to have contributed a chapter to that book. <clears throat> Dr. Shuba is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and she is on the executive committee of the Population Reference Bureau's Board of Trustees. She is currently a 2022-2023 Wilson Center Fellow on leave from the Department of International Studies at Rhodes College, one of the country's leading liberal arts colleges. Dr. Shuba is also affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She has trained at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, and she has worked for the US Department of Defense in the policy shops on demographic and environmental issues. She received her PhD in government and politics from the University of Maryland and her BA from Agnes Scott College Phi Beta Kappa. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Shuba. Well, hello everyone. Let's see, is this, how's the sound working? Good? Okay. Uh, I think for me, when I hear my bio, which is all, always, Kind of horrifying. But when I hear my own bio, I hear Dr. Valerie Hudson in my bio because the majority of that would not have been possible without either her directly writing me letters, reading things, sending in, in pieces for books, or without her paving the way for, for this. Um, certainly the timing of her work on uh, missing women and the connections to national security in the early 2000s, I think is part of the reason that the Pentagon started to pay attention to these issues and therefore created a position for a demographics consultant that I could then, timing being everything, go fill. So I thank you for that very much. So um, I thank you Dean Welsh also for the wonderful invitation to be here. Can I mute this computer because uh, I can hear myself being myself. Did that do anything to you in the bad, okay. That's great now. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so I find that people think about population very similarly to how Goldilocks thought about porridge. There are either too many or too few, but there are never just the right number of people. Too hot, too cold. And, and who gets blamed for that or who has to take the responsibility for that? In almost all instances, it seems to be women. So as I see it today, our task is to explore and discuss and problematize the various framings of the global birth strike. When births become an issue of national security or an issue of the economy or an issue of social relations, what's essentially happening is that an issue that many people would take to be one of a personal issue, the decision whether or not to have children or when to have them or how many to have becomes elevated to an issue of national concern. And what I think is so important about this is I think most of us are aware that that has happened in the realm of abortion politics, but we can even leave that aside and just think of us as individuals, do you have a duty to reproduce for the state? Does the state have an obligation to you? So that's what I think we're having uh, our discussion about. This project I'm working on at the Wilson Center is in part about bureaucrats in the bedroom, a title I know Valerie loves, and, and just to think about the relationship between us and our government. What kind of mutual responsibilities and obligations do we each have? And so I don't see it as my job necessarily in this time that I have with you all to, to decide that. I think that's what we'll do throughout the day. And I am very excited to hear from my um, fellow speakers as well. 
but instead I want to give us a, a language and some lenses to look through. And I also get to be someone who gives us a bit of demography 101 here. So we're gonna set the global birth strike in context. And part of this is understanding where we came from demo demographically to get to this point. So a few minutes on demography 101 for you. How did we get to this point? So here is um, a, a graph I put together of how long it took us to get to various milestones. What's excellent with the timing of this symposium is that on November 15th, on or around November 15th, world population hits 8 billion. So this is something that's in a lot of people's minds and will be in a lot of your headlines very soon. It took from all of human history until about the year 1804 for us to get our very first billion people on the planet. And then it still took a long time for us to get our second billion. But you start to see the, num the, the time to billion shrink over, over time. And that's primarily because we had a greater understanding of health. And so people lived longer, they lived past infancy and childhood into their reproductive years. We see an acceleration in um, global population totals. Now, part of what we will work towards today is thinking about where we go in the future. So you can just kind of keep that in your mind. Uh, and, and there's a great deal of uncertainty about that. And I think each of us who's informed about demography could pick a different number and then we can come back and we can see who was right. So, um, but I think it's important for us to also note that the global population growth rate peaked in the 1960s. So even though we think about some of low fertility and its, its cousin population aging as relatively new, it is a long time coming. We were headed that way many, many decades ago. And I don't think, I think in the national security community as well, we don't think about it having peaked in the 1960s because it really wasn't until that many years ago that the national security community was more focused on high fertility context. So it, it's actually been around for a while or headed this way for a while. So I said, part of this is understanding where we came from demographically to get to this point. Part is understanding how demographics shape a society. So you should know that populations, total populations, change from only three ingredients. It's actually pretty easy to understand. There's births, deaths, or migration, which is of course the subtitle of my book <laughs> on purpose here. And, and so I like to think about these as dials that are turned up or down to get an infinite number of outcomes. You know, in some societies there are a lot of births and we would also have a lot of death. Well, that would mean, mean that overall the population might not be growing very much. You can adjust the dials so that uh, we take care of mortality. You might have a lot of immigrants coming in. You might have a lot of people leaving. And this changes your overall population size within a country. The concern about contemporary population trends among higher income countries in particular because these are the ones that were really leading the way with low fertility, is number one, slow, no, or negative population growth. So hand wringing over birth strikes would be our population is headed towards a smaller number. And number two is a shift in the age composition. So we kind of heard both of these in Dr. Hudson's remarks that we think about um, fewer children at the bottom, your average age rises in a society. And so one way to understand this is picture lining everyone in a country up from youngest to oldest, and you ask the middle person to raise their hand. The age of that middle person is increasing as the years go by. And just for a little context here, the world's oldest country is Japan. That middle person would be 48 years old. And then if we ask someone in Nigeria, the middle person in Nigeria to raise their hand, it'll be 18 years old. So we have a big spread around the world. Um, quick note on the mortality and migration part of this. I think a lot of what we focus on today will be the fertility aspect of this, and rightly so. It's called the global birth strike. But these conversations or frames that I will be talking about today, they also relate, I think, most easily for us to picture to immigration, right? Who belongs in a society? Who should be there? What contribution do they make? And so all three of these ingredients to population change is, is something I want you to keep in mind. 
Now, let's take a look at what it looks like when these dynamics shape a society. So I'm gonna give you three examples here to walk through. Um, have you seen these before, these population pyramids? Yes, a lot of people have seen these. So um, you, they're just so fun to play around with. You can download them on the UN website. They have a, the new UN data from 2022 has a lot more interactive features. So nerds like me can just sit there and click around forever. So this is Ethiopia. If you see this classic pyramid shape of a population, you know that you're looking at a place with relatively higher fertility. Now, what is this? So we have on the on your left in green, males, and on the right in this purplish color, females. And we have ascending age groups, in this case by one year increments. And actually what they add here is the year of birth, which I think is always really interesting to look at as well. You can find yourself if we had if, you know, the country where you were born and how big these populations are. So in Ethiopia, the fertility rate right now in 2022 is around 4.2 children per woman. So of course, the population will be growing rapidly. And if you imagine where are the mothers, so picture them in your mind over here, and then think about each one having four children, and you can see why it grows in the shape that it does. Turkey is a fairly classic shape of a country that hovered around this replacement level fertility, which is generally around two and a little change children per woman. The, the margin of error there helps account for, for females who might not make it to reproductive age, we say 2.1. And Turkey did hover around this for a while, so eventually you get this more stovepipe shaped structure. So yet again, picture the females of reproductive age, picture that they had roughly two children each, and you can see why you would get a stovepipe shape. Now, in 2022, Turkey's uh, total fertility rate is estimated to be 1.7, so we're talking below. And actually, you can see at the bottom where that would have started to come in. So I love these because you can see the past and the present and the future all in one snapshot over time. And the last one here, what does it look like for the world's oldest country, demographically speaking? So again, you want to picture these potential mothers and the fact that they have 1.3 children per woman on average. And of course, we have headed towards what's called an inverted pyramid. So when we're trying to understand why this global birth strike has been elevated to an issue of national security, I think it helps for us to picture where the center of gravity is in different populations, to look at these pictures and think, how many elementary school children are there? How many desks do uh, we need to buy for them? How big is your working age population how big is the potential mothers? How big is your cohort of potential soldiers? And then to think about those who have exited the workforce. And, you know, Japan is headed towards a top heavy society. It is already a top heavy society. And so why would a, the bureaucrats be in the bedroom? Well, because they care about the overall shape and composition of the society from an age perspective. Now, Dr. Hudson mentioned this really remarkable statistic that I think we should pause on to think that two out of every three of the eight billion people on the planet live somewhere with below replacement fertility is astounding because this is something that has never happened in all of human history. And um, it also makes me feel old because when I first started studying these in the year 2000, almost no one had even thought about population aging. And the fact that just 20 years later we would be here is, is really remarkable I and mean, it shows the power of fertility, um, that we can reshape the entire planet by the billions. Global fertility is a low around the world. That includes in non-democracies. And I think that's really an area for us to pay attention to. And it's something that I'm going to highlight today as one of the themes, population um, aging, for example, low fertility, these trends, I do not think are inherently good or bad. I don't think there's any demographic trend that's inherently good or bad. And I'm trained as a political scientist primarily, which is useful because it helps me understand why the same demographic trend in two different contexts can have two different outcomes. And so we you know, I don't want us to walk away today thinking that demography is destiny. Instead, I hope what we walk away from today is thinking about the range of possibility 
politically, economically, socially, and thinking also in terms of the types of policy interventions that might come. This, you're only expected to look at the colors for those of you who are sitting far away. I did just wanna show the extent of low fertility worldwide. It's really everywhere except in most places of Sub-Saharan Africa where fertility has still fallen in many places. <clears throat> I'll also note that in the year 1968, out of the 200 plus countries we have in the world today, 125 of them had high fertility defined as five or more children per woman. Today, there are only eight. So we've seen this remarkable a change at the top end of fertility, but what we're focused on today is this, it just kept falling and falling and falling and falling places around the world. So why is fertility low? And tongue in cheek, I put this crying baby on there because you know who do you not wanna ask why is fertility low? Someone who's probably holding or up in the middle of the night with a crying baby, right? It might be a question that you have, and it's one that I get asked a lot, especially as I did book promotion. I found that to be one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life was speaking to wider audiences than I was even used to. And I thought I was already speaking to wider audiences, but about this trade book on population because of the level of confusion, particularly among males who would interview me. I don't understand why women wouldn't want to have babies. And, and a, just a complete, but, and I thought, this is, might be part of it, but of course there's so much more to it than that. Depends on when you ask somebody, right? What stage in their life. My, my youngest is now eight, but I still feel the, the residual you know, PTSD from some of this crying here. So what about this list of reasons? I can't give you one reason. It's not just crying baby, because they're also absolutely precious. Sometimes they're not crying. So I might think about it like a big old soup pot of low fertility, and we are gonna add a lot of ingredients to that. One reason it's down in the United States is that teen pregnancy is down. This is a point that can really confuse the hand wringing among some people on the political spectrum because they might lament that um, total fertility is down, the US population will be headed the way of most other countries in the world, but part of the reason is because teen pregnancy is down. So it is never just so simple uh, that we could either celebrate or vilify a certain population trend. Other reasons that it's down. One is that globally, our age at first marriage is up. It's rising year by year. If anybody in the room has adult children, you will have noticed among their peers, people are getting married older and older ages, which also means that the age at first birth is up as well. And if we think about a woman's reproductive years, very roughly from 15 years old to 45 years old, if you are not going to have children until you're married and you get married much later, then you have a shorter time in which to have children, which would then mean you would have fewer children overall. So that was part of the reason as well. It's another ingredient in that stew. There's a general preference for smaller families over larger families. So a normative family defined by our sociologist friends is two to three children and larger families is four or more. People are preferring smaller families. Um, I think it's important to note that when we see fertility rates like 1.5, it doesn't mean that the society is full of only children. It actually can really differ around the world. In some societies, women would have zero children in some society, and then they would have two. So the average comes out to somewhere around one. So these are the types of things I think we need to open up with the nuances. Why else don't women have as many babies as they might have in the past? I've heard a lot more talk lately about concern over environmental impact. And I know in the classroom, many of my students come to class, and I teach environmental studies, saying there are too many people. The world is overpopulated. We hear this a lot with the hitting this 8 billion milestone as well. And so um, it, to me, it really echoes a lot of the discussions in the 1960s and 70s with the zero population growth movement. Um, and the, but what we don't know is whether or not those feelings about there being too many people will actually translate to those young people having fewer in the future. So that is a question that we still have in terms of research right now. And I'll also point out um, there is a, a new article by some sociologist friends of mine who looked at these environmental impacts 
um, environmental attitudes and fertility preferences among 12th graders in the US from I think it was 2005 to 2019. So measuring how people felt about the environment and how many children they intended to have. And while they found that there was an association with that, it wasn't necessarily what I, I would have thought going in. The, the 12th graders who felt most strongly that the government should be involved in dealing with environmental issues and that the environment was a serious issue, they only pr they preferred family size of two to three, not a family size of four or higher. That's not what we would think about in terms of environmental impact. You might think, oh, that means they prefer zero. But then, of course, if they prefer two to three, but we know their fertility rates are below two, we're starting to notice this gap between the number of children people say they prefer and the number they actually have. And I think it's that gap we want to, really want to start to think about throughout the day today. There are more reasons why fertility is low. Increasing urbanization is part of this. Um, we do see there's an association fertility is generally lower in urban areas. Many places in the world are already saturated in terms of urbanization, but in parts of the world where incomes are really still rising from lower to middle income, we see increasing urbanization, and which means we're gonna to continue to see fertility fall in those places. Women's education is up, women's employment is up. And what's interesting to me is that women's education and employment, plus access to family planning and reproductive health, this is the package that the um, countries around the world have used to lower fertility from when it was very, very high. We know if we put in schools, keep women in school longer, give them other opportunities for education, that they will have fewer children. But there's not this shut off. So this is a question as well. I saw some very disturbing things on Twitter even this morning about um, over-educated women. And so I see some red flags with, oh no, do people start to think that women's education is no longer a public good, but instead a public bad. That's a real danger. What you should hear in some of these variables that I just told you is opportunity cost. So why would fertility be lower in an urban area. I hope that kicks through your mind. Some of it is going to be cost of housing, the size of housing. I mean, raising a lot of children in a very small place is quite difficult. We saw, seen a lot of reports out of China that that's been one um, thing that has depressed fertility there. Some of it is opportunity cost. So what do you have to give up? Sometimes in an urban area, you have to give up some fun. Yes, that's a real Thing. It's hard for us to quantify and take seriously, but it's a real thing. What else could you be doing with your time? You also have to think about giving up employment and potential education opportunities. And so opportunity cost is a thread that I see run through a lot of these. We also know that the cost of childcare has risen faster than inflation and other costs in the United States, for example. Cost of housing, as I mentioned, is tremendously high. Um, I did some field work in Singapore several years ago but I remember speaking to some youth groups there who were telling me that their, the housing was so expensive and the flats were so small that they didn't even date because they said, logistically speaking, it's really difficult for us to think about having a serious date when I'm basically sharing a room with my parents. And these were high income people, high income, not low income. And that's just how prohibitive the cost of housing was there. And of course, we see Singapore has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world, lowest of the low, down below 1.3. We know in general, there are fewer marriages in some places. That's another depression. Again, we're adding ingredients to this soup pot here. It's never just one of these things. And we also know that one of the um, important factors is whether or not a society has a stigma against births out of wedlock. So that's an interesting one to track. So in societies that don't have a stigma against births out of wedlock, we often see fertility on the higher end of the low spectrum and societies where there are stigmas on the lower end of the low spectrum. For example, in Japan, only around 3% of births are out of wedlock and we know Japan has one of the lowest uh, fertility rates in the world. So how closely coupled are marriage and childbearing in a society? That would be something for us to think about. And I think relates a lot to what Dr. Hudson said in her opening remarks about just even this institution of marriage and relationships between men and women. 
And then there is also concern about the future. So pessimism about the future is actually really powerful uh, determinant of fertility. It's one of our ingredients. And we saw this actually in Eastern Europe, as our um, colleague can tell us, um, after, uh, you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, actually both, that a lot of populations felt pessimistic about the future, and that was part of the depression on fertility here. So are people around the world worried about the future? Yes. If we look on the left-hand side here, this is a Pew Research Center poll looking at, and, it, and they, they conclude that the majorities in most places that they surveyed, surveyed were pessimistic about their children's financial well-being. So it's the idea of how do you conceive of the future can be a determinant of whether you conceive at all. The uh, median was 70% believe that children will be worse off than their parents. And that is a real sea change from a general historical trend that we had had where su successive generations were doing better than their parents. In Japan, they are taking the top spot here with 82% of those surveyed saying that children would be worse off. In France, it was 78%. Italy, Canada, Spain, the UK, Australia, US, Belgium, and Greece are all above 70%. Um, interestingly, at the bottom there, that's Israel with only 27%. Israel has relatively higher fertility. So, and Hungary's at 51%, by the way. So, you know, that's not, that's not bad, actually. This is part of it. But see how hard it is for us to nail it down to just one reason? We can look at the right side of the screen, which is a poll done um, and published in the New York Times. Why are young adults having fewer children than their ideal number? This gets to this idea of the gap between the number that you say that you want and the number you actually have. Well, we, as I read these aloud to you, I want you to think about what could be done about this? I use that passive voice on purpose because we don't know who we want to do these things. Child care is too expensive. That was 64%. Want more time for the children I have. Worried about the economy. Can't afford more children. Waited because of financial instability. Want more leisure time. All right, now we start to see a shift right there. So we had some like, straight up expenses. Then we have some opportunity cost. Not enough paid family leave no paid family leave, worry about global instability. We have this idea of the future as well and the present. Worried about domestic politics, met a partner too late. Worried about climate change, responsible for other family care. Worried about population growth, prioritized my education and career which I think is an interesting shift in the way they were worded that as a social scientist as well. <laughs> Split from my partner. Partner doesn't want children. Don't think I'm a good parent. That was only 13%. Maybe that says good things about us as people. So when we see this list, where do we think that policies could come in to help? This is a question that many governments around the world who have been concerned about population have asked themselves. And we're going to get some very clear um policy examples from Hungary today that I'm looking forward to. We frame this as a birth strike. Is there a strike? The terminology strike implies that we have a behavioral change until certain conditions are met. I would say that yes, some women are striking, waiting for better conditions, but certainly not all. So I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone else today about how they, they see this as a strike or not, what conditions would need to be met. And I think that partly goes into the policies as well. So I'm going to wrap by giving us some lenses for our discussion. So framing low fertility. Here are a few. And so as I, I'm going to read a few stories to you about places around the world that had extreme measures when they were concerned about population, but not unique. And I think that that's, that's what I would like for you to realize. So they're extreme, but not unique. They're, every government around the world is paying attention to how many people they have. Some of them think it's too many, some of them think it's too few, but they're all paying attention and they're all enacting certain kinds of measures to deal with that. Some are effective, some are not effective, some are coercive, some are not coercive, but everyone's paying attention. Okay. So what if we think about low fertility through a national security lens? This is the one we're primarily here to talk about today. If it's a national security lens, 
sometimes countries will start from the idea that we need enough soldiers. Do we have enough boots on the ground? And so those population pyramids I showed you earlier, they would pay very close attention to the potential pool um, of, of soldiers in the future. This is something militaries have always done. And you can think about, uh, we have lots of readings about France in the 1800s thinking about this as well. So this one is, is very common, but that's not all of it for national security. Um, we've also thought about um, whether or not the economy is strong. The same group that might be boots on the ground are also potential workers. And so you'll see the national security community fold in discussions of population when they think about whether or not societies will have to choose guns over butter. Do you have enough potential productive workers? That's, again, a discourse that has been around for a long time. Where I tend to throw some caution in this is that if we're going to frame birth striking in national security terms, we really risk human rights becoming negotiable or expendable or secondary to the rights of the state. We know that rights can be suspended in times of war. Can reproductive rights be suspended in the name of national security? That's a big question here. Um, I think it's also important for us to note that the spread of low fertility is beyond Europe and Japan, and it is in non-democracies. And just as I said that the same population trend does not have the same outcome in two different places, should we really expect to see more coercive policies instead of family-friendly policies, which we will hear from in non-democracies? So let me offer a, a few examples of coercion because I have a colleague who will be giving us some non-coercive examples here. One of the common examples is Romania. So many of you have heard of the story before. When Romania's last communist ruler, Nicolae Ceausescu, took power in 1965, he was under a lot of pressure because Romania was falling behind the demands of the communist economic model and needed more workers. So the population was at that time 86% Romanian. And even though Ceausescu needed, knew they needed more workers, he really hesitated to bring migrants in to dilute that ethnic pool. So think might think of contemporary examples here as well. So he thought, we need more Romanian babies. How do we get more Romanian babies? Romanians were not having them. Fertility rate was 1.8 at that time. And with 1.8, that's below replacement. So you could see the future. Those labor shortages were only going to intensify. So the package of policies that he chose were to make abortion illegal, to station police at obstetric and gynecology offices, and subject women under 45 years to monthly gynecological exams in their workplaces. And it worked. Romania's fertility spiked 100% in just one year to 3.66 children per woman on average. In his mind, labor shortages might persist in the short term, but down the road, 15 years or so in the future, there would be enough able-bodied children to staff Romania's fields and factories. Now, another that is not the only example. More babies for soldiers or workers, fewer babies for faster growth and stability. So sometimes countries want fewer. Case in point, on the opposite end of the natalist policy spectrum are the world's demographic giants, India and China. At different points in time, British colonizers, American elites, and uh, various Indian elites were concerned about high population growth in India. We can see many US presidents talking about this in, in some of their writings um, during the Cold War. And so a national family planning program was put in place in 1952, but the state did not launch serious action until Indira Gandhi was elected to lead in 1966. Gandhi faced foreign pressure from America, and so she was intent upon limiting Indian. So between 1974 and 1977, there were 12 million sterilizations in India. The majority were for men because vasectomy was easy and cheap. But as in Romania, many of these measures were coercive. So the state is involved in this case in limiting family size. Teachers who declined sterilization could lose their pay. Villages that were receiving irrigation risked having their water supply cut off if they failed to meet local sterilization targets. 
So although Gandhi was democratically elected, she was able to use forcible methods, even with popular resistance. 1975 in June, she proclaimed a state of emergency and ruled with a heavy hand until she was ousted along with her Congress party in 1977. Now, arguably, the real problem in India was poverty, not overpopulation. Although Indira Gandhi and the leaders from the international agencies who offered loans to her administration assumed that population control was a prerequisite to economic development, as we have seen elsewhere around the world, with rising incomes, it's quite likely that Indians would have started to prefer fewer children on their own without coercion. So coercion is not necessary. Police policies such as access to family planning and reproductive health, women's education, these also yield tremendous social goods as well. Coercive policies were unnecessary at best and immoral at worst. We also, of course, have seen this happen in China, and many people know of the one-child policy, which um, Dr. Hudson's research has talked about many of the knockoff effects of the one-child policy and how it encouraged um, acting upon preferences for male children over female children to the tune of millions of missing females, as she mentioned. So I think it's important for us to highlight that there are a, a rainbow of coercive policies that have been enacted when governments decide that the population is of utmost concern to them. It is hard for us to disentangle, I think, national security and nationalism, but there may be a, a few things for us to, to, to pick on here throughout the day. If we look at this issue of the global birth strike to a nationalist, through a nationalist lens, I want us to think about this in terms of an existentialist issue. At what population point does the nation cease to exist? This is an important question that each low fertility country will be asking, and they will come up with different answers there. Around 50 countries in the world are already shrinking. Japan and South Korea are shrinking rapidly. South Korea, I think, is the one of the most remarkable um, cases of this. And, and so I've, I've, I went ahead and did something that I almost never do, which is give you your data to 2100, because there's so much uncertainty. I usually don't go that far. But what's nice about going out to 2100 is it says, if nothing changes, then this. So as a political scientist, things change all the time. But if nothing changes, then this. You see Korea's total population just really shrinking in the in over one century here. We know that Russia's population shrank by up to 600,000 people a year in the mid 2000s. So if we frame this way, we frame the global birth strike through this nationalist lens, I think that points us to asking questions about um, intergroup fighting, which will be different than the national security lens. You know that in many countries around the world, there are questions about replacement. Is one demographic group going to replace another demographic group within a country? And so I think that is all folded into this nationalist lens. We can also, this is our last frame, frame this in gender terms. So we can look at this issue of the global birth strike here as women become the focus. Why aren't women having more children? Because at the end of the day, they are the ones who have them. We know that there are shifting preferences for children and shifting priorities. And so when marriage as an institution is not serving women, many women are choosing to forego marriage and then for choosing to forego having children. Um, there are t names for these women. Uh, they've given themselves names in some societies. In South Korea, they talk about Bihan in Japan. I uh, remember learning about breeders early on in my academic career. And then this is just a trailer from a new documentary that is out, meant, to be pro pro meant for us to provoke some discussion for later today. Um, I, if anybody wants to hear more about this, I actually interviewed this filmmaker for um, a free newsletter that I have. You can uh, take a look. The issue that came out this morning is a longer interview with her about why she did this film and what it might mean. But let's take a look at this. About two minutes. Nobody doesn't want kids. People cannot want kids. It's a thing. That is not a thing. Well, it's my thing. 
known since high school that I did not want to be a mother. At one point, you just declared that if I ever want to have grandchildren, don't look at me. I didn't really ever want kids, but I always assumed I would have them. I kept asking myself, is this going to happen to me? Does it have to happen? What does it mean to live in a world where motherhood is our destiny? And what happens if we say no? Remember, your biological clock is ticking. I gotta have a baby. I gotta have a baby. I gotta have a baby. Do you have a biological clock? Not ticking within me. Um, so I, the answer would have to be no. There's no biological reason for that to happen. You could list any number of honors and degrees and somebody will still think that you're not fully accomplished if you haven't had a child. Motherhood has increased in value yet again. It's almost fetishized in our society. This is the real solution to climate change. Babies. Nations need childbirths. Babies are good for the economy. This is by design. It's like, I'm not missing anything. I didn't forget to have kids. I'm just not interested. To have somebody tell you, you don't know what's best for you is extremely condescending and insulting. Never question my African identity because I'm child free. You can be an aunt or an uncle to your friend's children and you'll be fine. In fact, you'll be great. Don't forget to take your pill. I won't. So I really wanted to talk to uh, this filmmaker because I do think we're having, we're having trouble finding language to talk about when women don't want children and we can't attribute it to one of those larger factors such as just childcare expenses or uh, you know something that, that we can really wrap our brains around. And I think that's really the ch one of the challenges that we have when we talk about the global birth strike. I think we're kind of, without that vocabulary, we're not going to have really comprehensive solutions. And so for, uh, as the filmmaker finds, and a, a lot of the reason that um, some of these women are not wanting to have children is that they're just stepping away from it all. They're rejecting some of these traditional markers of womanhood in society. And so I wonder how far policy can really go when we have these overall um, cultural and social issues. Now, in many societies, we have come to think about lo um, lowering fertility as a sign of women's empowerment. So um, we'll hear from, from about Afghanistan later today. This is one of the countries where the U.S. poured lots of money over the last couple of decades into women's education, access to family planning, and reproductive health to lower fertility from a high of seven children per woman on average under the Taliban to now four and a half. And that is sold to us as, as, as women's empowerment, and I buy that. But then, and, and I am not an alarmist about population uh, at all. I, like I said, I don't think demography is destiny, et cetera. But there is one alarm bell that is starting to ring for me, and that is very low fertility. So when we're talking about um, Hong Kong, for example, 0.79 children per woman on average in South Korea, you're looking at about 0.9 children per woman on average. I am wondering if at what point we hit it is no longer a sign of women's empowerment, but instead a sign of women's disempowerment. And I think that's where I would like to see our conversation go much more in the future. Now, what happens when the bureaucrats are in the bedroom? I promise to deliver on that. Uh, this is a picture of Romania's population today. I told you you could see the past, present, and the future in one snapshot. And you can see the past. You can see those policies of Ceausescu. And as soon as women were no longer forced to have children, they no longer did. And so um, that is one of the dilemmas that policymakers have is that because throwing bunches of cash at the problem is often only a temporary solution to raise fertility, the set, the choice set gets more limited. And I certainly have fears about future coercion. Uh, Russia is, is a country that has often celebrated motherhood. I have like Soviet medal here for, for motherhood and and, and Hungary will not be the only country that we think about in terms of 
money. Um, we really, I mean, I get a, a tax break. I have two children, a tiny, teeny, tiny tax break. But these policies come in all shapes and forms on the non-coercive side as well. I am happy to take some questions from you, and I look forward to hearing from other people. I'm easy to find online, so please, please connect. Like I said, you can hear more about this um, global birth strike from the, are we obligated to have children from the state on this newsletter that came out this morning. Thank you. Thank you for a, a very, very interesting talk. Um, could you say a little bit more about your, your final point about when the birth rate gets so low yeah. is a sign of women's disempowerment? Because I'm very familiar with the argument that women are having control, right. um, empowerment. But could you say more? Uh, yes. I think, I mean, this is where my thinking is. You're, this is right in the middle of my thinking on, on this. You know, I, I, I'm wondering so and asking more questions than I would have answers. But it seems to me that if fertility is really, really low because women are throwing up their hands and opting out of the system the way it is, the way Dr. Hudson had articulated, um, it would be relevant here as well, then that mu must therefore reflect that they are disempowered in society as it stands. And therefore, they're just stepping away from it completely and kind of creating their own communities. I mean, it's really interesting to, if you, if you, I have a lot of child-free friends, which is different than childless, and they're in their 40s and their 50s, and the way that they have organized themselves socially is a real alternative model to the, the social model on my street in suburbia, you know? And so I think that's, we should ask more questions about the status of women in super low fertility societies. The questions that I did not have several years ago when fertility would hover between, you know, 1.6 and 1.9, that again seemed to me to be a fertility level that was at least correlated with societies where women would go get further education like PhDs or they would get higher paying jobs. And then as I started just a few years ago to really notice it was following, falling so incredibly low, I started having questions about whether or not the societies were serving those women in general. And I think you know, there needs to be a lot more conversation, a lot more research about that. And also for us to try to figure out how to research that. I really think some of this is very difficult to quantify. Like, what is the, I just don't want them from, a, you know, a sociologist. Where do we stick that in our categories of variables? Or do we just really try to say, well, that's not a good enough answer? Because that's the problem, I think, is that that is not considered a good enough answer from either the general public or social scientists, because we don't know what to do with that answer. So we said, give me more. And I think what I like about this film, it's, you know, there are many things to debate about the film, but what I liked about it is that the filmmaker says, yes, it is. That's a good enough answer. So that might be something for us to talk about today as well. Thank you so much for a really, really terrific presentation. I really love the issue that you raised at the, at the end. And it seems to me that there's no contradiction between saying that women have been empowered, but mothers have been disempowered. And if you look at kind of <clears throat> patterns of earnings in the US today, women who are not married and don't have children earn exactly as much, if not slightly more than men in the same age group, whereas mothers pay a, a really big penalty. So I think that, um, is a really good example of the contradictory impact of both economic and, and demographic change. Absolutely, absolutely. Any others? Thank you for the um, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I have a um, question that is uh, related to how fertility decision is made. And um, 
to an economist, uh, I feel fertility decision mostly is a joint decision by both men and women. So I was wondering if um, we know what men are thinking about fertility and particularly related to uh, security and peace. Mm. On the what men are thinking in terms of fertility, there was, I thought I had typed out this quote. Um, there is a, a new book by a colleague that I think is, oh yes, here we go, uh, useful, uh, Vegard Skirbeck. So a shout out to him, and it's called The Global Fertility Dis Decline. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've walked away from his book with, he says, the ideal number of children differs by amount of work expected. In countries where men do little, they want more children than women do. In countries where men are expected to participate more in child rearing, women often want more children than men. I think then this is where our economist friends, of course, can help us start to understand these, these issues of work as well. Um, in general, I don't think there's been enough of a focus on the men. Because the, the go-to is, well, the women are the ones who ultimately have the children. So I always see it through the lens of women getting blamed for too many or too few with very little discussion about where what the men's role is in this. Um, there is some research in high fertility societies about men's preferences and how that changes by education. We see in low fertility societies, men's preferences and how that changes about um, relationship to, to work. Um, but maybe again, part of what you're pointing out about these relationships between men and women is how do we get inside a marriage or a partnership a relationship to understand what what point that ultimate decision is made and who makes it, which would actually be useful to keep the conversation, to keep the spotlight off of only women, which, which would be good. In the national security community, I don't really see any focus on the men. I, now we may see something different, but I would say zero. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, two questions from DC. Uh, do you see a difference in public attention to dropping birth rates by the level of reproduction and are nationalists dominating the conversation? Uh, on do, uh, The last one I can repeat and then I'll ask for the other one again. Do nationalists dominate the conversation? How about nationalists and, and environmentalists? That's who I see dominate the conversation and guess what? They're at two different ends of the spectrum. Those are, the, those are the communities that I see in the, the turn on the news, pick up a, a popular magazine. It, those are the two communities that are most commenting on reproduction for the good of the world, for the, to the detriment of the world, for the good of society, to the detriment of society. And what was that first one again? Do you see uh, differences in public attention to dropping birth rates by the level of reproduction? I don't know that I understand that one. Do you know what? It oh, gotcha. Yes. Okay. So when do when do when do uh, societies start paying attention? I think they do start paying attention when it comes to issue of the economy. I in in, in my interpretation, the one of the first flags to, to pull it out of maybe a, a the bedroom and into the, the public sphere is concerns about the economy. I think economists are attuned to what's going to happen in the future. And, and you know, there are many industries like the life insurance industry, for example, that are always aware of demographic numbers. They're always aware of the future and how different proportions of society change. And I think it starts to be brought into the conversation as an issue of the economy, either at very high levels of fertility, where the concern is how do you get economic growth when 40% of your population is under 15? And it continues, but when does the alarm bell ring? I think when the economy is seen as under threat from the wrong proportion. I just love your work, Jennifer. Huge, huge fan of your work. I wanted to make a comment and then uh, ask a question. The comment I wanted to make is when you stuck up one of your slides uh, and it looked at the reasons why people are, are, are not having children or do not want to have children. I can't remember how the question yeah. was phrased. 
almost 20% said that their partner did not want children. Yeah. And I wonder if that has has changed over time. Do you know? What I don't know. But it's a good question. I think it's part of, you know, if I think about why don't I know, and I read about this all the time, would mean, and I'm trying not to, so, you know, filter what I read. I'm not getting enough information told okay. to me about those partners. I, I found that figure actually kind of shocking, yeah. right? In this day and age, what's the purpose of marriage, you know? And, and it's almost kind of boiled down to, well, if you're going to have kids, you get married. But if you, you're not having kids, why would you get married? So how that 20% came about, I think might be an interesting yeah. question for the future. But my main question, of course, is this which is in your experience as someone who's really done a deep dive, a great deep dive into all of this, do non-coercive pronatalist policies ever work? From what everything I have read, a little bit, right? And that is, if we look at France is the classic example. Is it going to, is the fertility rate going to go above two? No, it's not. But is it 1.3? No, it's not. It's more like 1.76, I think. So what we're talking about are, are these margins here. And so different studies are going to find different numbers of whatever it's 0 0.04 children, as you said before. Um, I think looking at Scandinavia is also interesting, but it's not just pronatalist policies. That's why that's a, a region that I think is very, is one we could study more. We're not going to nail it down to just uh, family leave that includes both men and women. That's going to be part of it, like adding in the soup of relatively, and they have relatively higher or low fertility, but also um, equal work, you know, and in, in the home sphere, also having much higher proportion of births outside of marriage. And so all of those variables that I mentioned before, you could kind of rank these different areas of the world by those. One of them, or two, or three, or four, will be things like family leave, cost of child care provided for by the state, et cetera. But then there are other social factors about relationships between male and female partners and their involvement in household and parenting duties that we should also pay attention to. That it, where, where do policymakers try to tweak that? How do you try to, how do you change that? And actually you've done work about how the, the governments can actually lead the way in normative change in other societies for other research questions, I would be curious to know if you think governments can lead the way in normative change in these ways. Because I think it, it is two different issues. But let me know what you think. <laughs> okay, and then that's probably, um, you could, anybody else has other questions? Okay. Um. My, my question might be very naive, but we are talking about the reason not to want mm -hmm. having kids, but it seems like there is not enough questioning of why we would want to have kids. Like, it seems like just that should just be the default, but maybe if we knew more about why we want kids, non-coercive yeah. policy would be easier. That filmmaker looks into some of that as well. I mean, I think that's actually her, what she's trying to do is shift our paradigm to say, quit making that the norm. I want you to make, being child free, the norm. And then I want to explore why someone would move from that to the having of the children. I mean, also in this as well, I, I can't, part of what I, I may have left the impression that it's either have them or, or don't have them, but there's also have one or have two. And that's, that's really a big part of it as well, or have two or have three and have three or have four. And I think most people, I mean, everyone in this room at some point will have had to make a decision about zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, and, and we all know how complicated it is to go for that actual decision. I mean, I could not even describe the decision making without sounding like making no sense. So um, I think shifting the paradigm that way, we are going to learn more. Um, and that's a that's a great comment, actually. So what are or has it been noticed like South Korea and Japan of having that low birth rate? Have they? noticed it and have they implemented policies or what are they doing to increase their fertility rates? They have absolutely no noticed it. Yeah, it would be hard not to notice. Um, and yes, there are different family pa policies. Shinzo Abe was, no, you know, you remember him talking, there was the womanomics of Shinzo Abe and some of that was making 
trying to make work and family life more compatible for women. That was that was part of that, and um, it had limited results because I think there are these larger social issues. I think where they're running up against the policy, the limits of policy is those larger cultural issues about relationships and, and work and family life compatibility uh, are not easily fixed through a set of policies. So, oh yes, they know all about it. So you've talked about policies that would add incentives, but I wonder if you'd say something about the removal of policies that might create a different set of incentives. And I think about this as the child, children used to be your social insurance. That You had a lot of children so that some would make it to adulthood and someone could take care of you when you're, you're old. But now there's social security, there's ways to outsource that care that it doesn't have to fall on your children. And so as we sort of think about this draconian contraction of policy, right, there's a way to shut that off. And I wonder if you wanted to comment on sort of the, right, is it changing that part of the policy landscape could be, a, is, is a different problem possibility? Yes, I think that's great to point out. And so let me give some examples of that. So if we look at Singapore as an example here, um, that Singapore is a country that puts the family as the center of care, not the state. That is institutionalized through how what's taken out of your paycheck, um, all the way to their Maintenance of Parents Act, where parents can sue their adult children for failing to take care of them. It is not just an act that's on paper. About 200 cases a year get litigated in the courts on whether or not you have taken care of um, your your parents. So they're a society that said, oh no, the family will be doing this. And, and you might think, well, then you should have a whole bunch of kids. And yet they have some of the lowest fertility in the world. And so I, it's a great political science question, which is why I also had it and also looked at this in a paper comparing Singapore and Taiwan, because I think that is an interesting question for us. You know, in the national security community, I often hear, oh, China's going to go broke from population aging and we in the United States are going to be just fine. And I say, forget it. You are wishful thinking. China has not promised to take care of its old people in the way that the United States have. We both have a median age of 38. Fertility in China is lower than in the US, but it's 1.64 in the United States. Immigration is down in, in many instances, believe it or not. And even when immigration immigrants come into society, they don't come in as babies. They come in in those working ages. And so it doesn't offset population aging the way you might think it would. So I say, watch out, look for who's promised to take care of the older people. That's the thing to pay attention to. So that's a good point. Thank you all. Break time, right?